Apex is a programming language designed specifically to be used on the Salesforce platform. It's an extremely powerful tool and needs to be used in the right way. In this video, we're going to examine some best practices for Apex and understand why they're best practices. Hi, I'm Andrew, Salesforce Technical Instructor at Salesforce Ben. Our mission is to help you advance your Salesforce career. So whether you're just starting out or have a few years under your belt, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out our extensive resources on salesforceben.com. Now, let's get into our best practices when working with Apex. Bulkification of your code is the process of making your code able to handle multiple records at one time efficiently. This is mainly true for triggers, where up to 200 records could be run through at once. For example, from a data load. If your code hasn't been written to take that into account, it can lead to errors being thrown or worse, unexpected behavior. The only time you may choose not to bulkify your code is when you can guarantee the number of records and then invocation will be low. This may be from an API or an Apex action invoked via a screen flow. However, due to the ease of bulkifying most code, you should probably get into a good habit of doing it regardless. There are times when you may wish to insert or update multiple records at once or query sets of records based on specific contexts. You may be tempted to either query or run the DML on these records while within your for loop because what's the worst that can happen? <laughs> well, quite a lot, let me tell you. Sockle and DML are some of the most expansive operations we can perform within Salesforce Apex and both have strict governor limits associated with them. So. Sticking them into a loop is a recipe for disaster, as we can quickly and unknowingly reach these limits, especially when triggers are involved. For DML statements, we can shift those statements outside of the loop, and instead, within our loop, we can add the record we wish to perform those operations on into a list and perform the DML statement on our list instead. For almost all situations, this is the safest and best approach. This is another best practice burnt into the minds of most developers and one which we have all probably broken at some point. This one can also be referred to as avoid logic in triggers, but regardless of how it's referred to, the intent is the same. When writing triggers, if we place our logic directly in the trigger, it becomes very difficult to test and maintain. Instead, what we should be doing is using our trigger to call classes specifically designed to handle our logic. These can then be easily tested, maintained and reused. We commonly call these classes trigger handlers. Moving on, this best practice is a very easy one to remember and to implement, the practice of utilizing only a single trigger per object. But why exactly is this rather simple best practice such a vital one? When multiple triggers are defined on a single object, when a record is saved and the triggers are invoked, the order in which the triggers are run cannot be guaranteed. For all intents and purposes, it is random. It's common for individual actions within a trigger to have an order of priority, or it may have a prerequisite on a previous action having been completed. For example, assigning a parent lookup, which is then expected to be populated in the next action. Having a random trigger order also introduces randomness into your code. This randomness makes it harder for us to debug and develop code since we always have an element of randomness and can no longer accurately replicate scenarios. When we begin writing a brand new class, one of the first things we should do is declare our sharing model. If we require our code to bypass record access, we must always declare without sharing. But when we want it to enforce sharing rules, developers can often find themselves skipping this step. Explicitly declaring our sharing model allows us to show our intent to anyone else who works on our code in the future, which could even be yourself. This allows them to more easily understand what's going on within the code, omitting it obfuscates our intent. The only time you can safely omit it is when your class doesn't perform DML or queries. However, if there's the possibility of this happening, or if you want to play it safe, it's wise to declare the class's sharing model anyway, specifying it as an inherited to allow a consumer of your class to control the model instead. Consider this scenario. You need to always set the account lookup on a specific record type of contact to be a specific account. You may consider hard coding this variable, but that would be a bad idea. Hard coding IDs might work fine and without incident when they are developed, but as soon as we migrate our code into production, those IDs will no longer reference the correct record. 
This is especially true for record types created in a sandbox and then migrated into production. Consider the opposite situation. If we create a sandbox from production, our hard-coded IDs will no longer point to the correct records. If we wish to utilize record types, instead we can reference them via their developer name, which will be consistent across environments. If the ID we wish to use relates to a specific record, we can instead store this ID in custom metadata and retrieve the value at runtime allowing us to freely change the value between environments or as requirements change. There is only one scenario where we don't need to follow one of the two above approaches, and that is where we are explicitly referencing the master record type. This is the special default record type and is fixed across all instances. However, just because it is static now doesn't mean it will always be, and so you should probably all store it in custom metadata if required, just to be on the safe side. One of the many and more esoteric governor limits within Salesforce Apex is the heap size limit. This is a runtime limit on the memory our code consumes dynamically as it runs. And if our code exceeds this limit, the governor system will terminate our transaction. When we query a large set of records and assign the results to a variable, a large portion of our heap can be consumed. While this might be fine during test runs where the volume isn't as large as in a production environment, as the query dataset grows in volume, more of our heap will be consumed and the result of a query could easily push it over the limit. Instead of assigning our query results to a variable, we can place our query directly as the iterable variable in our for loop. This causes some behind the scenes changes to how the query is performed, causing the results to be chunked and processed much more efficiently and transparently, preventing us from running into heap limits we may have previously encountered. The only time we might want to avoid doing a Sockle for loop is if we are performing an aggregate query. These queries don't support the underlying mechanism that enables the more efficient chunking and instead will throw an exception if the result returns more than 2,000 rows. Next, we have naming conventions. Naming conventions tend to be a hot topic in any developer team. The benefits are clear if everyone follows them as they make it easier for other people in your team to understand what's going on within an org. The specifics of what makes your or your team's naming convention are up to you to decide, but following this will reap plenty of benefits when it comes to maintenance and collaboration. There'll be less head scratching while you figure it out so you can spend more time on the fun stuff. When we are writing code for an org, the chances are the sections and pieces of that code are repeated throughout the code base. One may be tempted to simply copy and paste these methods or code blocks into different classes, but this very swiftly creates an unmanageable mess. Imagine a scenario, you've written a useful method to help assist build dynamic Sockle queries. Another requirement comes up that you know will benefit from this method. So you copy it into your new class and it works well. Three weeks later, a rather severe bug has been found in the initial consumer of your method which you promptly fix. But now you need to go and apply this fix to the other class you added it to. This very quickly becomes unmanageable as you need to update every place it's been copied to and each time it introduces a greater risk of further bugs due to human error. Instead, what you should be doing is placing these reusable pieces of code into their own self-contained classes and calling these classes and methods where you require that functionality. This can massively reduce the complexity of your code which requires these methods. And when a bug is found in your module, it only needs to be fixed once. You can be confident it will be fixed wherever that code is consumed. Having a set of well-tested and well-written modules to draw from is a surefire way to accelerate your development and it will likely increase your development experience. Make sure you don't fall into the trap of building monolithic utility classes, classes that are doing way more than they should be. These classes become very difficult to maintain and if multiple developers are working on a project, avoiding conflicts is a nightmare. Utility classes should be small and serve a specific purpose. If you can't wholly define a class's purpose, it might be getting too big and a split in may be in order. Salesforce mandates that we have at least 75% code coverage when we wish to deploy Apex code into production. And while having a high number of lines covered by test is a 
good goal to have. It doesn't tell the whole story when it comes to testing. Writing tests only to achieve the code coverage requirements shows one thing. Your code has been run and it doesn't actually provide any value other than showing that in a very specific scenario, which may or may not ever happen in practice. When writing our tests, we should worry about code coverage less and instead concern ourselves with covering different use cases for our code, ensuring that we're covering the scenarios in which the code is actually being run. We do this by writing multiple test methods, some of which may be testing the same methods and not generating additional covered lines, each of which runs our code under a different scenario. For example, this could be covering a positive test case and a negative test case in a trigger. After we've run our tests, we then want to validate that the code has actually performed its intended action. And if it hasn't, manually foul the test. Tests like these provide far more value than simply writing tests for code coverage. These types of tests can act as an early warning system for issues that may arise when an admin needs some new functionality or a different piece of code gets changed. Testing for these scenarios ensures we are alerted about the issues and can resolve them before hitting production and causing late nights. Best practices are a vital part of every developer's life. Knowing the why and the what can help us grow into better developers, allowing us to make more informed, smarter decisions about the impact our choices can have, both in the short and long term.